Um, today we're going to be discussing how to buy a rental in 2024 and one huge mistake that you need to avoid. So let's jump right in here. Um, we really think 2024 could be a great uh, time to buy your first rental property. Rates are probably going to go down a little bit. And um, prices probably won't, but with rates going down, it may make it a little easier to cash flow. Well, there are prices that are going down in some markets. Uh, I mean, True. as we all know, I mean, ho you guys are probably, you know, Mo a lot of you are probably looking in one for spe specific market, so you know, that is where you're gauging a lot of stuff. But in, um, I've been I've been looking. You know, mm -hmm. there you know, there's some fairly big discounts. Uh, you know, days on market helps. <laughs> yes. Obviously, the higher rates help, and um, so I think the, uh, you know, obviously whatever he's banking on is the hopefully the Fed lowers rates in March, but we don't know yet. Yep. Yep. Well. So there are certain things you need to do if you're going to buy a home in 2024, though, right? And I think that the first thing that anyone always needs to do is get pre-approved. Yeah. I, I well, yeah. So let's back up before that. Okay. I agree with you. So the question is, you know, should you buy this year and why? You mm -hmm. know, and, and there's a couple of very, very big compelling reasons. The first one is all you got to do is Google this. There's a massive, massive, massive disparity between home ownership and rentals. Okay, so in in affordability. So what you have is you have a lot of folks right now that are going to be forced into renting. Right now, you're going to probably read some stuff that says there's going to be a lot of supply hitting the market in the next uh, you know 12 months, 18 months, and I actually have to agree with that those projects started two three years ago a lot of them and um, they're definitely going to get delivered so we're going to have this temporary supply adjustment let's call it and that's good if you're going to buy but after that there's no question that there's going to be a tremendous amount of pressure on people that want to rent Right. So yeah. so that's big picture. Right. So if you believe if you believe rent's going to go down, then it's probably not a show for you. <laughs> if you believe rents are going to go up like I do based on the math, then you might want to consider investing in that trend. You, you know, that's all this is. You know, I'm not. You know, there's. You, and if you're lucky, you might even get capital appreciation on your home, you know, on whatever it is you buy. But but I just had a friend buy a duplex uh, last month mm -hmm. uh, just outside of Kansas City. And it cash flows, you know, barely. <laughs> but he said there's, uh, I think he said there's about $500 per unit. There's It's a duplex on both sides. So it has a potential of, of uh, his cash flow has a potential of going up by $1,000. After the tenants leave, or he 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 raises them, or whatever his strategy is. The point is, it's a value add. So there are deals of cash flow out there. So so with that, I wanted to back up and just say, if you're serious, if you believe that you should roll it all forward, and and try to do it in gold or stocks or something like that, then by all means. But you know, there's one thing that's for sure is we're gonna we have a massive massive supply problem hitting the U.S., not just U.S. Okay, yeah, and so to start, you always want to get pre-approved. That would be step number one when you're buying a rental property for the first time. Yeah, and and lenders are <laughs> chomping at the bit to find folks like you. Yeah, like you know, think of think of the dry run they've had. So refinances are down. You know, home buying is down. All that stuff's down. So so lenders are really, really, you know, they're not they're not real busy at the moment. So this is a great time to go get pre-approved and go get all your all your stuff in order, just like you did, right? You did this. Yeah, and it's always good to get pre-approved because then you know how much you're approved for. So then you it can help you when you're deciding on what you want to buy. Because yeah. obviously we all want to buy the nicest thing ever, but it just depends what you are approved to buy. Yeah, and it, it'll, it might even create a strategy for you because you don't have to do it by yourself. You can do it with a partner. So mm -hmm. 
there are you should just definitely go through that process. Yep. So the second step is finding the area that you want to buy in. And this is a super important step. I think it's the most important step. Mm -hmm. You guys like I wrote about this in my book, The ABCs of Real Estate Investing, which has been all I guess, 18 years ago. I can't even believe that. That was one of the first things that I said was the market's more important than the property. I still believe that. And I didn't realize at the time how powerful that statement was, but it is. The market is more important than the property because you have markets. You can buy the same property in different areas, the exact same house, let's say, by the same builder, and it's going to perform differently based on the market. You know, And so knowing where you're buying is probably the most. You can buy an ugly duckling or a brand new home in in a market that's that's going down and it's <laughs> both are going to lose money well and too and i think people um because they're trying to spend less money a lot of times try to buy a rental in an area that's outside the city center and that can be problematic because you know not as many people want to live in certain places outside the city center if it's not by amenities if it's not if it's up and coming if it's all these things and then you have a lot of vacancy yeah that's a very good point a lot of people are chasing the the price there's nothing wrong with considering that but to daniel's point if if you're buying in an area that <laughs> nobody feels safe in or nobody wants to go to or that's regressing then uh, it's not going to be a, a, a good deal and you're going to blame it on everyone. But the reality is it's not the, that real estate is good or bad. It's that you purchase in the wrong spot. You can you can also do the exact same thing in an area that's progressing. You know, there's there's opportunity zones. Uh, if you guys don't know what those are, you should look because there's there's money pouring into these opportunity zones for tax purposes that are revitalizing areas. And, you know, and there's, there's areas that are being redeveloped and replanned and all over. So those are the markets that maybe it's a good idea to buy that ugly duckling if somebody hasn't already. And then, and the, and to capitalize on that trend, I always say, don't try to be a pioneer. You know, that's right. the last thing that you want to be is a pioneer in a market. You know, you you, you want to wait till the game starts and come in around, you know, maybe when the first quarter's over, you know, <laughs> you know, and then then uh, and, and take a look at what other people have done before you and, and, and catch it before that run. So but the market, the, the market and the sub market, you know, even like where we are in Phoenix, Phoenix, there's hundreds of sub markets. Hundreds, you know, there's and every sub market has different things going on they have transportation they have grocery they have shopping they have some some people don't need cars some people do some people have parking issues you know so there's uh, schools or another big one where people decide to go or not go so you got to pay attention to all that stuff and pick pick the right market if you pick the right market then you just be an expert in it well and that's the thing right so your your market as ken said should be a sub market so i mean you should have a few block radius that you want to buy in. And then what happens is you become an expert in those blocks. So you know what the rent can rent for. You know when a good deal pops on the market. You know when something's overpriced um, because you're such an expert in that market. And that's where you want to get to. And you don't want to stream outside of that market. So you just want to wait for the right piece of property in that market to pop up. Yeah, I, I remember as a kid, my dad used to say to me, like, I was born on the wrong side of the tracks. Now, some of you might not know what that means, but to him, it meant um, an area that was much poorer than the other side. And so, um, you know, quite literally, though the tracks, uh, you know, can represent a road, can represent a river, it can represent all kinds of things that are that are uh, that are marks in a, in a market that can be very very different from neighborhood to neighborhood so that's why real estate is very much a local business and there are things that go on from 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 block to block yeah and and so step number three is once you're pre-approved you know where you want to buy you then have to decide what you want to buy. You need to know exactly what you want to buy. Do you want to buy a one bedroom, a two bedroom, or a three bedroom? Do you want to do something that's rent ready or do you want to do a fixer upper? Do you want a condo? Do you want a townhome? Do you want a single family home? 
and what are you pre-approved in your price for too so you need to know all of those things yeah yeah there's story after story after story i have hundreds of these but a good friend of mine's son was um in the air force and i played football at the air force academy and then he moved um i'm trying to remember the i think it was Fairchild, um, up, up outside of Spokane. I remember he called me. He's like 26, maybe. Um, he's a young man. Uh, he's in the military. He got transferred there. So he had. He's like, I, I don't want to just pay rent somewhere. And so he ended up, um, after chatting with him, he ended up buying a five-bedroom home. And he rented out the other four to his buddies. And he was cash flowing and living for free. Now, obviously, that's a very unique, targeted story. Uh, but it is a strategy because there wasn't a lot of rentals in this area that he wanted to be in and it was hard for him to even find a five bedroom home but he wanted a five bedroom home specifically because he could rent each room how it's called house hacking now it's obvious but again to your point not every single you're not going to find a five bedroom house in downtown somewhere <laughs> you know right so you know so you have a different strategy there but you want to you want to design your strategy around, you know, the need. Let's go over some things too about what people shouldn't do when they're looking, you know, for different different things. So, typically we recommend against one bedrooms. Yeah, I do. For rentals. Like I've done a lot of condo projects in my day and obviously we own a lot of multifamily too, but the, the one bedrooms were always the ones that sat the longest. Mm -hmm. there, there's a definite need for one bedrooms because they're affordable and all that kind of stuff. But typically, a lot of times you're relying on a couple or an individual where if you have a two bedroom, you might have a couple and a, and a, and a kid or maybe a couple roommates or, you know, you, you just have more options, even though they're a little bit more. And I'm talking about both on the rental and uh, on the purchase. Yeah. And, and also, you know, to rent a two bedroom as an individual or a couple versus a one bedroom, it's only a few hundred dollars more. So a lot of times, even an individual or a couple might want a two bedroom, maybe especially now with the work from home to have a home office or to have it so their friends can stay and, you know, guests can stay and have a, a second bedroom. So you're it's going to be cheaper to buy the one bedroom, but you have to remember how easy is it going to be for you to rent it. Well, but here's the other thing to consider. Let's say rent for a one bedroom is $800 and a rent for a two bedroom is 1200. Well, you can get two roommates that are going to pay 600 versus 800. So you have to think of if you're going to rent it, think of the tenant. Think of the person renting it. It actually saves them $200 a month by splitting it. Obviously, they have a roommate, so it's a very different scenario. But you, you kind of get the point. Yep. So the next one we, we got to is rent ready or need some work. So I think there's a lot of, and I, I actually was guilty of this, and I, I just got lucky. Where my first condo, I almost bought a condo that needed a lot of work. I just, the one I ended up buying that was rent ready happened to list the day I was supposed to um, sign the offer on the other one, right? Because I thought, oh, you know, these popcorn ceilings need to go and we, the kitchen's low. We need to hire it. Well, in Daniil's uninformed head, this was like 10 grand or something, right? It would have. If the kitchen's low, how do you hire it? Well, there was like a I'm divider just kidding. I'm just kidding. in between the kitchen. I've lost. And, sorry, between the kitchen <laughs> and the uh, basically like a half wall in between oh, the kitchen yeah, yeah, yeah. and the, got the, it, the got living got room. It. I do. I do. You had a so reason. in Daniil's head, like all this work and there was other stuff too was like ten grand. Realistically, now what I know now, probably like seventy or eighty thousand dollars at least worth of work, right? So if you're gonna do one that needs work, make sure that you know the pricing. Ideally, you're handy and you're doing a lot of the work or you know people and can really monitor the contractors. But if you're new and you're getting your first rental and you don't know that much, I recommend doing something that's rent ready when you buy it. See, I, I don't necessarily agree with that, but I do understand it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're quicker to market. And if you can find, you know, if you can be the person that creates the value yourself and, and you have the money, I, I don't, I think 70 or 80 is too high, but you know, if it's, if you're buying a $300,000 place and you can make it look amazing for 15 or 20 and I, you know, I know you can do that because we do that. 
that's one of the things that our business does. Uh, you know, we have a whole renovation division. And, and so I know you can buy appliance, a whole appliance package for a few grand. And I know you can do flooring for a few grand. And I know you can paint for a grand. And, you know, so, you know, once you start doing the basics, um, you should be no more than 20, let's say 15 even. Um, and you can, you can get significant value there. You can create significant value by doing that. That's essentially how flippers make money. So it, it is a strategy to buy fully done. And, you know, let's face it, if you don't have the time or the energy, there's nothing wrong with that either. <laughs> like uh, the house we bought was fully done, right? Mm -hmm. And it was like easy because there was a renter in there a week later um, and it cash flowed like crazy. So I, I think, you know, there is a strategy and it would have been off the market for a while. And there's, you know, managing all the contracts and stuff. But if you have the time, I actually like the value adds. I think you learn a lot. And also gets you kind of connected with, you know, who does gr really, really good work. And um, and it gives you a little bit of time to, you know, with the asset itself. Well, just make sure before you close that you know what the rents are going to be both before and after. Um, and also, let's don't forget, when, when we start seeing these affordability problems in our own company, now, we'll, you know, let's face it, people are facing affordability problems with inflation and all the stuff and rent growth. Now... There was, we had a strategy, you know, we, we call them classics. Let's call it a property that I bought 15 years ago, like one of them in San Antonio. I have a 680 unit building in San Antonio I've owned for maybe 15 years. We said, you know what, let's, let's, let's keep some of these as classics. Now, they're 15 years old, <laughs> you know, the appliances are 10 years old, you know, as long as we maintain them well, they're fine. But, you know, they're three, $400 less there's nothing wrong with having affordability inside as well, because if it's a long-term hold, you can always renovate it later. So don't, you know, you don't always have to buy that renovated one, but again, it depends on if you're in the business, if you have the time and all that kind of stuff. Yep. So then the next issue that you're going to run into, step number four, is going to be how much money will you need? And so you have to kind of look at that. Now, what a lot of people don't know is you only need about 5% down. They say 3 to 5%, but 5% is a, a good standard down um, for a first-time home buyer, right? Like if you're going to be yeah. living in it. You'd be surprised. Yeah, I, I was actually, um, I was talking to my trainer this morning who's who was in the military and you know, he's looking at a program that's even less. So, you know, there are lots of ways to, to figure this out. That's why that pre-approval piece is so important mm -hmm. that you'll find out that there's lots of different categories that, that, um, you know, you could potentially, uh, not everything's 20% down or 10% down, let's say, you know, in the multifamily space, it's <laughs> right now, at least it's 50% down. Mm -hmm. But in the, um, in the single families, it's, it's significantly less now. And if you can borrow, I think, well, aren't rates under six now? Somebody asked that. Um, I want to say they're six to six and a half, but I actually asked the audience if anybody knows currently what rates are that works in the industry, I'd be really interested. Yeah, that'd be that. cool. I know I pulled up an article last week because Mo was, you know, texting around. Rates are down, rates are down. Well, he uh, didn't text me. Uh, <laughs> my, well, my so I, all I did was pull an article up and said nine out of ten homeowners are under six percent. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, uh, that was on, uh, I can't remember which, uh, but, the, you know, so still a lot of people are sitting on those low rates is my, kind of the point. And I think, um, but to your point, it doesn't really matter if it cash flows, right? So if you can put a little bit down and get it to cash flow, then uh, your chances of having a, a, a good cash on cash is even better. So, you know. If, if you, a $300,000 house and you have to put 10% down, you know, obviously that's 30 grand, 5% is 15 grand. Well, if you can cash flow a little bit, then you just calculate that cash on cash return against the down payment. Now, obviously it doesn't include all the closing costs and all that kind of stuff, but you, you guys get the point. So you want to just calculate the cash flow divided into your down payment and that's your cash on cash. And um, also, if you're if you're if you're locking if you're borrowing it let's say five and a half or six and it cash flows you're hedged you know you're you know if we have inflation <laughs> funny question if um you know right now it's i guess three and change so i don't know where it'll go obviously none of us do but you're you're actually doing you're you know you're gonna get three percent 
on the entire asset, even mm -hmm. the even the borrowed part, and that's kind of the point. So three percent of three hundred is nine. Uh, is that nine? Yeah, nine grand. So yeah, so who doesn't want that? And that's an in inflation, so it doesn't always work. But you get kind of the point. So it looks like the rates are between six and six and a half percent right now, okay. based on what our audience is saying. Um, so yeah, so it's pretty obtainable to then save for your down payment. So then you go into step number five, which is the fun part. You get to start looking for a house. Yeah, right? that's, that's the fun part, I think. Yeah, like, it is fun. Guys, it's fun, but it can get frustrating. I know, but I look, I look every day almost. Mm -hmm. I don't know, do you? Yeah, just about. Yeah, like guys, like it's just, you know, while you're sitting there, you know, get off of the social media and jump onto like a Zillow or something and just start thumbing around. You guys will see. I always have a couple things I put in there. One is price reductions. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a price reduction thing that you can hit and it just shows. Um, so I look at new listings pr and price reductions and it's it's pretty interesting to watch you know how um and and then also uh, obviously days on market there's a whole bunch of things and once you start to do it you'll start to look at different things but that's why i know uh, specifically in in, in you know, i'm seeing many 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 uh properties are, are starting to reduce right yeah, absolutely. And and the biggest thing when you're looking at these properties is you need to make sure they cash flow. So that's super important, which is the income, the rent minus the expenses. Make sure you have all the expenses, CapEx, tax, insurance, everything. Um, and minus the debt. Minus the debt. Yeah. And then it, you need to have a positive number. Correct. Um, and one in, in that's kind of hard to find right now. So expect to do this math each and every day on a place until you find one that cash flows. And because you know your area so well, you're gonna know the rent you can get, and you're going to know that it's a good place for a rental, and you're gonna be very familiar with the neighborhood. Yeah, one of the, th one of the things you might wanna look at, guys, right now, there's a lot of stuff, I mean, we, we, we called this a while ago, there's a lot of Airbnbs that are starting to come back on the market right now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are not your normal homeowner. You know because there's bunk beds when you're yeah, looking yeah. You look <laughs> at the, the ad and yeah. there's bunk beds. But <laughs> this is inventory, I think, that, well, I know, that's hitting. So if somebody's strategy was just short-term rental um, and it's not working, which is certainly seems to be the case in a lot of instances, then that's inventory, which is good. This is positive, guys. Like... It's funny. A lot of you who own stuff want prices to go up. Well, that, uh, you know, it's a double-edged sword. <laughs> prices go up, it's harder to buy. If rates go down and prices go up, you know, your net net might be the same. So at the end of the day, um, you know, just, just kind of watch this stuff, but it, make sure it cash flows with a long-term renter in there. And, and don't, don't be afraid to be creative. So if it just rents with one family, for example, um, then... That's your only strategy. Yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be that. Yeah. And you you house hack. There's yep. all kinds of stuff. And just make sure, like Ken said, you're you're measuring it for a long-term tenant. Because right now, you're seeing all these Airbnbs. And my friend sent me one the other day. She's never invested. She has some cash. Hey, Danielle, this property looks so cool. There's four units on a property. And the owner's making, you know, I forget, like $12,000 a month and whatever. And I, I said, I told her, I said, listen, this is on an Airbnb. Airbnb is really struggling right now. You need to do the math on a long term. And based on the numbers, this doesn't work because they're trying to sell it as an Airbnb. And also, why are, if it's so amazing, why are they trying to sell it as an Airbnb, right? So luckily, she reached out to me before she went in and bought it. But, you know, just make sure that if it cash flows long term tenant, totally cool to put an Airbnb on it. But you don't want to assume you're going to have all these Airbnb tenants and all this Airbnb income because right now that industry is getting hit a little bit. Yeah. And by the way, just real quick on Airbnb. Airbnb as a company is growing. The people on the platform are growing. What happened was the amount of supply doubled. That's the issue. It, it, so it's oversupplied. So that there's a potential where a lot of the Airbnb supply is now going to come back on as listings like the one that Danielle was just talking about. That's good, actually, guys. That's really, really, really good because as we talked about last week with, uh, let's say, BlackRock and these big institutions buying up, they bought another big company out of Toronto last week. I don't know if you saw that, over 30,000 houses. So 
those those Airbnb, BlackRock, those are not homeowners, <laughs> right? That's the important thing to know that uh, those are people that are going after the the listings and they're trying to buy these things in bulk. So um, just it, hopefully it can swing back the other way this year. Yeah, absolutely. And then, um, so once you find the house you like, you make an offer and the due diligence then begins. So, and let's explain what due diligence is. Mm -hmm. You, when, 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 like when I move out of my house, I know right now, like there's four or five things that need to be done. Like everyone has a scenario, right? I'm not going to do that, of course, but you get the point. At any given time, there are things going on with a home, air conditioning, HVAC, could be a water leak or drainage or a roof or landscaping. It doesn't really matter. So when you buy something, you step into the shoes of the seller. So due diligence, quite frankly, all it is is just flushing out any and all problems before you actually take that ownership. And, um, you know, you don't want to be in a situation where you buy something and, and – um, you have to replace the roof in, in a year and you don't have the money. So those kinds of, things, that's a, you know, and oft, oftentimes I think one of the things I found interesting is these home inspections, mm, not always the best. So the home, just like just as, you know, as, as things started to roll and people started to get transactional, um, in my opinion, um, um, a lot of home, home inspectors uh, companies popped up too. And they weren't as thorough as some of the other ones now. But they're cheaper. Yeah, they are. So be careful. You want to find somebody who's super thorough um, and, um, uh, and, and finds everything. So then you can negotiate with the seller. In fact, on the, even during the heyday, we found uh, on both two projects, so the roofs needed replaced, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, so, and they, they, it wasn't a lot, five to ten grand, but still something. So you just, we, we, we put that back on the seller. So those are things, those are real things. That's due diligence. Make sure you know. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it's not the time to skimp. Um, that extra three or $400 yeah. you pay the inspector, yeah. you'll get back. Um, it's totally worth it. It's I, worth it. Um, I, you know. I found so many problems. Well, in on a residential property, the seller then has to disclose what your inspector found to the next buyer. So they can't just walk away from something that your inspector found. Right, right. I mean... Guys, there's, you know, you'd be surprised on how, especially renovations uh, that maybe didn't pull permits or weren't up to code, even even properties that never were renovated, we I found code problems. So you just really, really want to make sure that they don't become yours. Absolutely. Um, and then something else about the offer, too, I think is really important is make sure there's a timestamp on your offer. Now, an experienced realtor will do this. My first two realtors, not experienced, <laughs> didn't know. do this. I lost sales. I had, you know, bad experiences. But, you know, if you just say, here, I'm going to give you an offer and you just you just let me know. I'll just be sitting here. Yeah. Just let me know. Call me when you're ready. Then, then they, they have all this time, especially in a hot market, to collect other offers, right? Especially if your offer's competitive, right? But if you make a competitive offer and you say, you have till five o'clock to let me know, then now they're sweating bullets because now they either have to decline your offer or accept it by five. Right. And that puts you in a much better position. Uh, a newer realtor is not going to know this. And so you need to make sure, even if your realtor pushes back, oh, no, 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 I don't, you know, we don't want to be too pushy. And it, no, you need an offer and you need to have a five o'clock or some kind of deadline. As my buddy says, no pressure, no flow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like you want, like you do, you just want deadlines on everything, especially in this business. Absolutely. Um, so there are, now we love rental properties. They're amazing. You know, like Ken said, you can get the capital appreciation. You get the rental income. Rental income doesn't even count towards your social security as you get older. Like there's so many benefits. I think we should stop and talk about this. This is mm -hmm. a big deal. So I'm not going to go down the social security rabbit hole, but, you know, everybody knows what it is, right? You're paying in now and you get some of that money back later. The... Rental income does not account, does not discount <laughs> from the money you get. Like if you're working somewhere, then you actually get tagged a little bit on Social Security. So, but if, if it's rental income, if it's passive income, how crazy is that? Think about that. 
So you can actually, you can actually um, have two or three or four rentals providing income every single month, and it doesn't uh, it, uh, prohibit your, your Social Security income. I think that's a big deal, especially for a lot of people that are trying to uh, tax pl or plan for retirement. Absolutely. Yep. Um, but there are risks to rental properties oh, as well. For sure. So um, the biggest risk and the biggest mistake that people make when they buy a rental property is it doesn't cash flow. So they buy it in the hopes it will maybe appreciate and they can sell it or that rents will go up over time and then it will start cash flowing. Well, I, uh, well just stick with Danielle's strategy when we met. You know, she didn't want that. Mm -hmm. She doesn't really like it. Yeah. I I like that. I like to use it. We have two very different strategies. You know, her mine's more like Kiyosaki and hers is more like Dave Ramsey, right? Because mm -hmm. he doesn't. You yeah. know, right. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Two strategies, same home. <laughs> so, but the point is, um, back to the cash flow. She doesn't have to worry about that, right? Because she doesn't have debt, right? So when you don't have debt, it certainly helps on the cash flow side. Now. Um, again, you know, I built my whole company on using debt. And so we do have a different strategy there. But that is a way to do it, especially if you're retiring or, you, you know, there's nothing wrong with paying off the, the house and, uh, and having more cash flow. Because at any time, it's like a savings account. You could put debt on it. Yeah, exactly. And it also, you know, a lot of these first time home buyers, you know, they, it doesn't cash flow and they just think, oh, I'll feed it a hundred dollars a month or a couple hundred dollars a month. Well, what if rents do temporarily go down? Because there is a lot of supply coming to market, right? So temporarily you might have a decrease in rent. You might have a big capital expense, your AC, your HVAC system might go out. That's going to be thousands of dollars, right? And I, people get in over their heads. Might go out, like yeah, will go will out. Will go out eventually, right. And, and you're not putting any money in, so it's all sucking money out of you. And it's not going to be enjoyable, and you might not be able to afford it because some people are really tight when they get into to the rental market. And, you know, maybe you only have $500 a month to put towards your rental if you're not bringing in Well, let's income. just talk about you. Like, not including cash flow. How, <laughs> in the last three years... How much in capital expenses? Oh, I don't know. Well, what would you guess? Mm. 20, 30,000? Probably 20 grand. Okay. That's just that. Right. So, so we're not talking about your normal operating expenses. We're talking about things, real things that come up when people move out, things that happen. You know, if we, you've had some floods, you've had some, you know, you know, flooring changes, you've had appliances, you've had, you know, there, there are things. You know, this business has those kinds of things and even if they're managed by somebody else you're gonna be paying for it i i just had a um I, I years ago i was doing condo projects in vegas and i kept the models and um you know basically they're paid off years ago and it, you know i've had i had a tenant in there nine nine years in one of them i think anyway um the guy i have managing for me called me up and I, I stroked him a check for like 7,500 bucks. <laughs> now this person was in there nine years or something. Mm -hmm. But he showed me photos, man. It's like, obviously, you know, it's super dated and needed, you know, everything essentially. So uh, I wrote him a check. Now, over nine years, I think that's probably not a bad deal, but I still had to write him a check and uh, just to get it, you know, rent ready. And um, so those are real things. The wear and tear on units are real things that happen, and you mostly find them during turnover. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our closing advice is don't be in a rush to just buy anything. Make sure it cash flows, and it's a place people want to live. Yeah, again, guys. Happy Monday. <laughs> well, now we're going to jump into oh, our... Yeah. We're going to jump Sorry. into our premium. Ken, Ken's ready to go, but right. our uh, inner circle, our premium. If you want to sign up, go to KenMacroy.com dash uh, join dash now slash join dash now. Uh, you get to ask Ken questions. We do monthly happy hours. We have a bunch of different guests on. So our first question comes from Chad. And he said, I've heard the saying, don't let the tail wag the dog. Uh, the this tax tail. 
This made me think about whether I should let the interest rate tail wag the dog. I've got a single family properties locked in at three and a half percent. Should I hold these forever or should I not let the interest? Yeah. Um, the answer is yes, Chad. You know, <laughs> this is a really, really insightful question. And, you know, I was taking I was poking fun at Mo last week about this. But the reality is, is there's a lot of people in the country sitting right where Chad is at three and a half, four percent. Those you, we all know, like those those mortgages are assets, really. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, in accounting terms, they're liabilities, of course. But if you got a three and a half percent mortgage, you know, that's an asset. You know, especially if it cash flows. And so, I get the fact, Chad. You know, what I would do if I were you is I would just hold on to that sucker for a while, and and if if the Fed does what you know everybody hopes that they do this year, and we start to see some rate relief, you'll be um, and it starts to get close, then you know harvest the cash. You know, do a ten thirty one or a cash out refi or something. But right now, man, the rates are what three three points higher. So just calculate calculate the the next person is going to try to buy that. You know they're going to be three percent higher. Uh, that's a lot. So I, you hold on to those low on those low rates right now. And I, that's precisely why listings are so low. I think we're at forty percent of our market, our averages. Yeah, nine out of ten people are sitting under six percent on their mortgages right now, and there's no motivation for them. Uh, in your case, it sounds like you got a renter, but um, I would, I would keep that sucker for now. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and before we head into our next question, I just want to mention uh, you have a happy hour for our premium members next Monday. Um, and this Wednesday, I have a free webinar. You just go to KenMacroy.com forward slash webinars. I'm uh, going to be talking about how to save up and budget for your first rental. Yep, so it goes right with the topic today. All right. Second question comes from Dennis. He said, there's lots of talk of institutional investors in the housing market. I'm curious about what can happen to the housing market if and when their bean counters say to move on. If supply and demand is what's holding the market values up now, what happens if the institutional owner says, clear the books of real estate and employ money elsewhere? Uh, Could this change the market? A thousand percent, Dennis. It's a very insightful question. There's actually some legislation out there. Uh, Rogan was talking about it, mm -hmm. where you know, should these big guys be able to own, um, and you know, should th you know, there's some time frames around it all. Uh, one thing I can tell you, just from uh, dealing with a lot of institutions and Wall Street, et cetera, is they're really IRR driven. Or um, you know, I I I think that you know, which is the internal rate of return. Um, you know, and there, in order to, to generate that, there has to be a beginning and an end. In other words, you buy low, sell high, let's say. Um, and then if you get cash flow in between, great. But most of these are going to be rentals. And so there's go, there is a churn on money. In other words, uh, there's, to my knowledge, there's not an institution that I know of that is a long-term strategy has a long-term strategy for real estate so um, if that happens as they start accumulating you're going to see kind of a a churning if you will of um, you know like I, I think uh, I think BlackRock just bought a big company in Toronto 30 some thousand homes if you just track those over a period of time you're gonna see some you know they're gonna probably deploy some because again how do they make money? They make money when they sell. So, and that's uh, that's how returns are generated. But they're also talking about getting way more into corporate housing right now, or yes, into um, yep. the institutional investing. So I don't see that happening anytime in the future, just because they're talking about doubling down on it. Basically, they are. They are. Yeah, this is this is something that's gonna for sure happen. I guess what I'm saying is uh, his his point is is well taken there's definitely going to be um, sales every year but you know uh, there's you know 
BlackRock owns however many houses they own. There's for sure some are going to be hitting the market and some are going to be buying. At some point, maybe it's a net-net. But the point is um, there's going to be a churn. Yep, absolutely. And uh, the next question comes from Scott. So he really wants to know how you structure your deals. So he has a few questions. Mm -hmm. Do you typically structure deals in an 80, 20, 70, 30 plus interest on capital, such as a 6% return or just one or the other? Um, so, uh, I'm, we're a little different. And what I mean by that is, you know, if I don't like to buy properties that are, that I owe on the preferred return. So if, uh, if your number is 6%, by the way, um, nobody's raising capital at 6% today because that's what interest rates are. <laughs> that's <laughs> debt. So but let's say it was, um, I would want the property to generate 6% cash on cash to cover the PREF. In other words, I'm not as worried about the cash flow when I buy something. I would really, I would be willing to give all that to the LPs or the equity. I have no problem with that because I'm looking at something much bigger. I'm looking at the value creation and of course the tenants are paying on the mortgage and all of those other things uh, obviously um so the 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 worst thing you could do is is let's say borrow money at eight percent and the property cash flow six percent now you're behind two percent each year so um and so the 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 structure or the percentages that you know you can see 90 10 80 20 70 30 all the way up to 50 50 Typically, they can be sliding based on the returns. So um, it's a it's it's kind of a sliding scale based on the performance of, of the asset itself. In other words, you're not fixed necessarily. Um, the 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 worst position you could be in is a 90/10, let's say, and then you'd be forced to sell, and you might be paying or eight, nine, ten percent, maybe even twelve on the cash on the equity and then if there's anything after that it's 90 10 let's say that would be the worst case but there's you know that's kind of how you start and then as, as if the property performs it it moves up to scale mm -hmm, absolutely and then he asked do you set up a new llc for each uh deal yeah 100 uh, percent yeah. spe single purpose entities you don't want um you know Depending on the size of the deal, you, you can, you know, the purpose of an LLC is asset protection. So that's number one. You, 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 if, if you have 10 single family houses in one LLC and God forbid there's a fire and somebody gets hurt in one of them, then they actually, and they sue you, they sue everything in that LLC, all, so all the other nine. So, um, you know, you, you want each one protected. I believe, and it's so nominal, um, you know, and you're going to want to make sure that uh, it's just a, it's just an, it's just an insurance blanket around the asset itself and kind of isolates everything into that one. Uh, it is, however, there's, there's not, it's not always pros. You do have tax returns and all the other things associated with that one partnership too. So, so I, I've seen some people do multiple houses in one LLC, but uh, yes, on a bigger stuff, every single asset we have is individual. Um, Eli from YouTube's asking, have you looked into other markets outside of the U.S.? Yeah, I have. There's uh, obviously, I haven't pulled the trigger because I think the U.S. is actually quite fun. You, you know, I mean, <laughs> there's plenty here. There, you take a look at the laws, and not every country has the same property laws and landlord tenant laws and and ownership rights and and those kinds of things and so you know i always want to be careful of that but um, i have no problem investing in, in another country what's interesting you might know um ever if you're a u.s citizen you're taxed on your worldwide income so let's say you buy a property in belize you obviously have to report that on your u.s um um financial statements and and you know it's it's part of it's part of the uh, annual reporting so you're not going to dodge anything there's nothing wrong with it uh in, in my opinion to have stuff outside of the country but um it 
I just feel like the U.S. is so big and there's so many cool places and, you know, and I can kind of rely on, even though everybody bitches about it, uh, we, we, you know, the, the court system and the ju judicial system and all that stuff. Uh, it varies from state to state, but um, it's something that um, is in a lot of cases a lot more sound than, than other places. That's been my experience. Yep, absolutely. Well, thank you guys for listening. Make sure you check out my webinar on Wednesday, KenMacWord.com forward slash webinar on budgeting. And also uh, sign up for premium, KenMacWord.com forward slash join dash now for the happy hour. Yeah, we'll see you guys soon.